What is man that you are mindful of him? Let's read it together. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have displayed your splendor above the heavens from the mouths of infants and nursing babies. You have established strength because of your enemies to do away with the enemy and the revengeful. When I consider the heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you would set in place, what is man? That you're mindful of him, and a son of man, that you're concerned about him, yet you've made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You have to rule over the works of your hands. You've put everything under his feet, or sheep, oxen, and also the animals of the field, the birds of the sky, fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. In Matthew 21, there's this story about Jesus going into the temple and I'm looking around seeing all the money changers, people selling doves, etc, etc, and he drives them out, they're overturning the tables. You know the story well. But in the middle of that episode, Jesus quotes the psalm, psalm of David, the cries of babies. And he's generally talking about babies and babies that are being weaned on their mother's breast. Those still being weaned, he's saying, can, can actually bring down the enemy. I mean, how is that possible? It's not really possible, is it? How oh, a baby can confound an enemy, an army? How does that work? But I believe Jesus is referring to baby Moses. We've already read that concealed by his mother in a basket in the papyrus reeds in the bank of the river Nile because Pharaoh at that time wanted to destroy the male babies. The Israelites were getting stronger, the Hebrews were getting stronger, filling the land. They tried to stop that happening. And so for protection, mother placed him in the papyrus reeds. Pharaoh's daughter came to bathe. She sees a little basket there, intrigued, sends her servants in to gather it. And as she looks in, there's this little, little baby looking up, crying. She's touched. She wants to take the baby home. That baby grew up in the royal palace, became strong, became well acquainted with the ways of the Egyptians. And that adult was the one that brought deliverance to the captives that were there in Egypt when he stood before the most powerful man on earth and said, let my people go. Nursing infants can bring down the enemy. Not in our time frame, not in our ideology, but in God's. God causes it to happen. See, God often chooses the weak to confound the wise. God often uses the things that are shunned within our society to bring down the mighty. It's the way God chooses to do it. Paul puts it in a graphic way in, in Corinthians. He says God puts his powerful gospel into fragile vessels. And you might feel quite fragile here today. But if you know Jesus as your Savior, there's a treasure inside of you that's dynamic through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We have this treasure. 
from jars of clay, so that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. I'm glad it's his responsibility and not ours. In Psalm 42 verse 7, hear the sons of Korah got something significant to say. They're looking at their circumstances, the way they feel, feeling overwhelmed, feeling down. And ask the question, why are you in despair? What's going on here? Why are you cast down? Why are you restless within me? Wait for God. He says, I will yet again praise him for the help of his presence. My God, my soul is in despair within me. See, even in that condition, he's able, or they are able to praise the Lord. That's faith. Verse 7, deep calls to deep. At the sound of your mighty water. Wow, that sounds so deep poetic, isn't it? What does it mean? Sounds good. I'd like to read it. Deep calls to deep. At the sound of your waterfalls. And all your breakers, your waves, they wash over me. So you and I, I believe, are invited by God to search, to discover something of God. As we contemplate God, the vastness and complexity of Creator God, we're drawn into the depths of divine mystery that we can't solve. We can't fathom out by instrumentation alone. And that can seem like a fatherless void. Deep, calling to deep, the land in there, there is void. There's a mystery in God. It can't be found out, it can't be discovered by me searching. It's only as God reveals himself to us that we're able to discover him. I read the news last weekend and um, there was a, lot, a rocket launched. The Ariane 5 ECA rocket launched by the European Space Agency. I didn't see it actually in the launch, but I read about it. And it's going to Jupiter. It's going to take eight years to get there. And the instruments on board, they're going to look at Jupiter's three icy ocean-bearing moons. Looking for life. Maybe there's some sort of life there. Billions of years ago, they reckon, in the water that's now ice. And juice, that's what the spacecraft's called. Juice will enter orbit around Jupiter on July 2031. Eight years to get there. That's just the near side of that, of our universe. You know, Job, when he was going through all that he was going through, his friends sat with him posing questions, and, and listen to this, Job 11. So far, the Nephilimite asked Job this question. Job, can you fathom out the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? higher than the heavens above. What can you do? And they're deeper than the depth, the void below. What can you do? I, I love sci-fi. I know some of you do. I'm not watching the film The Abyss. It's a 1989 American sci-fi film where this, this American submarine, nuclear submarine, encounters a strange object on the sea, a strange illuminated object on the sea. It loses power, and it sinks into the Cayman Trench. Now, the Cayman Trench is pretty deep, apparently. It's on the floor of the Caribbean Sea between Jamaica and 
Caribbean, sorry, Jamaica and Cuba, 7,686 meters deep. That's deep. And it's sitting there on the seabed. And desperate to rescue any survivors, the Navy contacts this uh, oil driven platform called the Deep Core. And they're joined by a platoon of Navy SEALs. And they go after this nuclear submarine to rescue those on board. And there's, there's this unknown entity, the enemy. However, the enemy that they really face in this film is actually internal. The threat's internal. It's part of a man, part of a woman that could be twisted into something really ugly as they face the reality of their fears. Turns them into monsters through their own fears. And the, the, the film actually opens up with a quote from Nietzsche. If you gaze long enough into the abyss, you probably know this one, the abyss will gaze back at you. And the abyss literalizes this idea of what the characters see. The sin and the ugliness of sin inside of them. But here, when the psalmist uses that word, the abyss, in Psalm 8, it suggests a depth of mystery in God, in created God, and also a depth in us. The heart of man is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? We're complex human beings. You know, you, you, you can spend a lifetime with a person and then at the end of the day they do something uncharacteristic and you think, I, I didn't really know them at all. If it takes a lifetime to get to know somebody, how more complex is God? And that image, that, that image that God has placed within us the image, the mirror image of him has been tarnished by sin. All through creative history, God has used the medium of water to convey to us and symbolize the vastness of God. Not only that, but the separation between God and man. The hymnists have also used that medium in lots of their hymns. In the beginning, the spirit hovered over the waters of the deep. We're born again. I'm sorry, we're born through water when the embryo sap breaks and water gushes out. A Roman spear pierced the side of Jesus, outpoured blood and water. But here's the, the amazing verse, the kicker, if you will, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, 25 to 27. Are you going on when it's not working? Okay. The prophet speaks this out prophetically 600 years before it actually came to pass, 600 years before the birth of Jesus. God says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities. And from the idol, your idols, I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. I'll remove from you the hard stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my most What stunning promise. God to restore that fallen image. You may go die within, within an individual. <coughs> God makes that promise six centuries 
before it actually came to pass. So there's, there's, there's a time coming when there will be a transformative, brand new beginning in man. And it's going to be characterized by cleansing through pure water. And renewing on the inside by the Spirit of God. I've got a hot flesh. Cause you to feel things you couldn't feel before. Give you a love for something that you didn't love before. See, that's what's required. If you or I want to enter the kingdom of God and have the image of God restored into us, you may go down. That image that was tarnished, that was destroyed through the lies of the serpent. John chapter 3, Nicodemus, Pharisee, teacher of the law, came to see Jesus. He wanted in on this. He was looking for the consolation of Israel. He wanted to be part of the new kingdom. He wanted in on this, this, this Messiah that was to come. And Jesus said, you, you can't unless, you can't unless, you can't unless be born again. Can I be born when I'm old? Can a man, a woman enter into the mother's womb and be born again? I tell you, Jesus said, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water, and born of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, natural birth. My spirit gives birth to spirit. You don't be surprised at this saying, you must be born again. Let's hear that once again, what Jesus was talking about. Nicodemus. This is what's going to happen. I'll sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Nicodemus, I'm going to remove from you the hard stone and give you a new heart. You think religion's good right now and keeping the law? Oh, wait till you experience this. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my love. We're born again through spirit and cleansing water. You must be born again. And so Jesus is about restoring the image of God within mankind. John 9. Jesus says, as he went along, so a man was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man? His parents, so that he was born blind? Neither, says Jesus. Not this man, not his parents, they haven't sinned. But this happens so that the works of God might be, be displayed in him. As long as day, we must do the works of him. Suddenly, night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, washing the pool of saliva, which means scent. So the man went, washed, 
and he came home seeing. What do you make of that? Jesus healed a lot of people much more than you read in the Gospels. Here, it's, it's kind of, it's one of the freakiest healings in the book. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Gathering mud, putting it on a man's eyes, telling him to wash in the pool. You see, he's opening the man's eyes. He's restoring the image. Maybe Dea was lost after the fall. Paul says this about Jesus. Listen to this. For by him, as Jesus, all things were created. That are in heaven, that are in earth. Visible, invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist or hold together. Jesus here in, in, in this chapter isn't doing something new. It's not a brand new trick. Something as old as creation. Genesis 2, when God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, bearing its seed, fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit according to their kind, with seed in them. And it was so. God uses his breath, speaking to life. The plants, the flowers, roses, orchids, bluebells, everything else. Spring up because of the word of God's power. The second person of the Trinity, the word of God. He became Jesus Christ. In Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our own image. This is what he did. He gathered the dust that was on the earth, the dust that was soaked in a dew, because it hadn't rained yet. He gathered it up and shapes it into a man. This lifeless man was just lying there on the ground and God breathed life into his nostrils and he became a living soul. Just imagine that. Man became a living soul. And here in John 9, Jesus is recreating the fallen, broken image of this man who couldn't see a thing. In our bathroom upstairs, I've got this mirror. And on the bottom of it, because of the moisture, it's starting to rust a little bit. It is left to its own devices, and if it hangs there for some time, the rust is going to, you know, it's going to grow. And very soon, it's going to tarnish my image. And some people think that's not going to be a bad thing. As we look into the mirror, the image of God in us has been tarnished by sin. Because of the serpent's lies, you know, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Hmm. A couple of verses in closing. This is just the introduction. Paul says, Now may the God of peace sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, soul, and body Be preserved complete until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, one Thessalonians 5. You and I consist of a body, soul, and spirit. How do they relate to one another? Our interaction. How has sin tarnished and destroyed that work within us? 
What's the relation between the mind and the brain? What is the difference? Lots of questions. What is man? David asks. What is man? The Lord formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became living soul. So we're we trying to answer sorry, some of those questions. Yeah, our body was, was formed through dust on the earth. And our bodies are sustained by that which comes up from the earth, plant life. Animals, if, if you eat animals. And so with our bodies, we're in contact with everything else that's being created on the face of the earth. But with our spirit, we're in contact with God. And our spirit died and sin entered the world. And then we have a soul. We become a living soul. And with our souls, we connect with each other and every other living entity on the planet. Okay. A lot of questions. I haven't given you a lot of answers, but we're going to be looking at those, not next week, but hopefully the week after.